Well, good morning, everyone. So welcome to the study this morning. Um, we're going to begin by opening with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the time that we have to study your word, for the things that you have been showing us. And we pray, Lord, that as we look at these things in Judges chapter 15, that you can guide and direct in our understanding. We pray for each person that you can give us clear minds and an open heart, that you can correct us when we are in error. And um, help us to understand these things so that we can share them with others, that we can have a character that reflects that of Christ. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, we were addressing yesterday um, this final story here. I mean, maybe there's two final stories. You have the, uh, Samson when he's thirsty. You also have him uh, killing a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. And we had addressed, of course, the story there about um, the Philistines going to look for Samson in Judah. And the, the 3,000 men of Judah are going to uh, deliver Samson into the hand of the Philistines. And we had looked at this, you know, a few months ago when we were studying through the story of the judges. And now we're trying to put these things on a line. Now, when we looked at it the first time, we saw a lot of symbols here that tied us to 9-11. And, um, and, and we're going to see more of these as we go through. And the question is, how do we address this? We, we, I don't see this as a continuation of, of the story in Chapter 14 and the beginning of Chapter 15, which ends that story. I see this as a repeat and enlarge, yet there are aspects in, in our history which may be somewhat a repeat of past histories. So when we look at a line, we know that when you look at a waymark, you zoom in, you get a line, and that line can have other um, histories attached to it, other waymarks. So waymark in one line can be a different way mark in another line, but those events uh, can still be um, repeated in a sense, but they're not repeated in the same in the same way. They have a different purpose. But I think here we actually end up going back, reaching back to 9-11. So um, I'm going to read this over this last part. And then what we want to do is look at the things that tie this to 9-11. Um, so, where do we start here? Okay, I'm just going to go back a little bit. I'm going to read the story about... Um, I'm going to go back, just read this whole thing so we get the, the flow of this narrative. Then the Philistine said, who hath done this? And they answered, Sam they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. The he would, of course, be the father, taken the wife of Samson and given her to Samson's companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Eton. Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are you come up against us? And they answered, To bind Samson are we come up, to do to him as he hath done to us. Then three thousand men of Judah went to the top of the rock Edom and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, As they did unto me, so have I done unto them. And they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. 
And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me that ye will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand, but surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. And when he had come unto Lehi, the Philistine shouted against him, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, With the, the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand, and called that place Ramoth Lehi. And he was sore thirst, and called unto the Lord, on, on the Lord, and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the, the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst, and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? And God clave an hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Therefore he called the name thereof Enhenkor, which is Lehi unto this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. So when we read through this story, what things do we see that give us symbolism of 9-11? So if we go back, we started just reading some of this, this back story here. Um, so where would we see things that relate to 9-11? Anything that people can see? Your most obvious is the jawbone of the ass. Okay, so when we get to the story of the jawbone of the ass, we have Islam. And so we know that Islam in our history... Uh, we have 9-11. Um, and also, even in the story of the thirst, um, uh, so that, uh, you know, he's going to, so he's going to be thirsty. And, you know, if we go to understanding the lines, we know that that this is a period of darkness. And then you have a reform line that addresses that darkness. So if you're thirsty, a reform line would be about uh, receiving water. And you can see here, uh, is there revival connected with 9-11? Well, okay, you may have the revival connected with 9-11, but isn't the precursor to this revival shown in Judges 15-17? Um, okay, explain what you mean by that. Okay, the verse reads in what you have up, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called the place Ramoth Lehi. Now, Ramoth Lehi can also be translated as the lifting up of the jawbone. Yeah. Wasn't Islam lifted up on 9 11? Hmm. Didn't, it, didn't it become something that everybody saw, that the whole world understood? Yeah. Yeah, so this is all connected. Yeah. Okay. Now, this can also be not just the lifting up of the jawbone or the casting away of the jawbone. It just depends entirely on how we're looking at this. But when he is sore athirst, he called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. And now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. There were many in this country that were very perturbed would be one way of saying it. Quite angry would be another way after the 9-11 attacks. And they began to consider what do we need to do? 
but their considerations were not truly in seeking God. They sought their own, as we would say, righteousness. So this with 1518 is Samson is he really calling on the Lord or is he is he wanting to lift up his his own character rather than the Lord's? Or am I far am, am I too far afield on this? Okay, and I understand the difficulty because of the ironic nature of the morality here. Um, so, so what we need to do is we need to take the symbols that are here and not necessarily address the narrative so so much, right? At least that's what I'm trying to do right now. Okay. So, because you know, because I struggled with this thinking through this whole thing. Now, the one that we had was, uh, or the first thing that we had was this great slaughter. So that was going to be, uh, what if this was? Can't remember which verse that is in. Or was that verse with the word great slaughter? Um, just can't see it. I'll do it this way. It's in here. So, oh, it's going to be 15. Okay, 15.8. That's fine. So, so we had this back here in 15.8. He smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock, eat him, right? So we had this great slaughter and we connected this to uh, William Miller, right? With what he saw in uh, the, the Battle of Lake Champagne or, um, or Plattsburgh, depending which perspective you use. And um, so we, we have the symbol here of uh, the midnight cry. Now, when we look at the, uh, so when we look at 9-11, the way that we look at it is we look at it in the, this line of, from 1989 to the Sunday law. And so the arrival of the second angel is 9-11. And then we have midnight and the midnight cry that are going to precede the Sunday law. Right. And so Jeff is taking these things and 9-11 is the first day of the first month. The midnight cry, that's the the fifth day of the fourth month or midnight. I mean, the midnight cry is the first day of the fifth month and the 10th day of the seventh month is the Sunday law. And that's our primary line for um, this history coming up to the Sunday law. We take that Sunday law as the actual Sunday law. And in doing that, we tried to, to figure out where we were on the line. And we kept thinking, we kept reaching these false summits. That is, because we were in uh, tertiary lines, that is, we were zoomed into waymarks, and we had these reform lines, and then we would zoom into a waymark on that reform line, and, and we just kept doing this. We just kept... Um, you know, it's kind of like if you take a distance and, and you have to get to that distance. So you go, you decide, okay, we, we got to go a mile. So first I'm going to go halfway, go a half mile, right? And then I'm going to take that next half a mile and I'm going to go uh, halfway again. So I get a quarter mile, right? And you keep doing that. Do you ever reach your destination if you keep going halfway? It's, it's one of these little math tricks. I don't know. If you keep only going half the distance to your destination, will you ever reach it? <laughs> you won't, right? Because you're always going to be less. And in a sense, I'm not saying that we're not getting to our destination. But in, in some ways, it's like that. We keep looking at these lines and we keep seeing this 
where, where we need to go next and where we need to go next isn't actually our destination. It's just halfway. And so we keep getting these ever, ever smaller increments of, and, and more detail. So I mean, maybe it's not the best illustration, but that's just how it feels. Um, so I think we need to keep that, that line in mind in understanding what's happening in our line, because uh, we had these, these two way marks, midnight and the midnight cry. And how did we see them? What, what in Daniel 11 did we line up with midnight and the midnight cry? You know, and we started doing that in 2017. Uh, Raphia and uh, Paneum. Yeah, so we had Raphia and Paneum. So Raphia and Paneum become these, these way marks, which we would put on this line that we had established by 2016. Uh, I, I'm going to draw this because I think this is going to be helpful uh, even though we know this, it's to understand Judges 15. This is the only way that I can do it. I first need to start with this. So we will. Okay. One one question before you start drawing. Yeah. Is there not yet another symbol that we can take from Judges 15.8? Yeah, there's going to be lots of symbols. But what's the one you want to uh, look at? Well, as we would look at this, if we were again giving reference to the charts we have 158 being shown here yeah yeah and we determine that 158 is what well it's, it's the covenant well the covenant is, yeah right is it not an improper covenant yeah it's the covenant with death so okay. and remember we had had lined that up with um when we're going through the book of Joshua, right? Right. And, and what had we done? We had go, gone from 158 BC. Well, as it as it's being asked in the chat, is this the 15th day of the eighth month? Well, yes, it's the 15th day of the eighth month, right? Right. But we also had connected it with this covenant that they had made with uh, the Rechabites. Is that their name? Okay. <clears throat> but also with the covenant that here was um, Samson making this covenant with his Philistine wife. Mm -hmm. the he should not have entered. So does this give us a close of that covenant? I mean, we often speak of close of probation, but is this covenant also being closed at this time? Okay. So so we have to remember that, that we take the morality of the story and we, we look at it in the opposite sense. So Samson is Christ. All right. And, and, and so that, you know, so we can look at the story morally on the surface and we can say all these bad things that he's doing. But when we take the symbols here, this is not the symbols that we don't take these symbols negatively. We don't look at this as a false covenant. We look at this as a true covenant. So that becomes a bit of a, uh, a pro problem here. But we can take this, this covenant. We can take these false covenants and they can typify the true. Just like the true can typify the false in a sense. So there's 1,335 years from 1493 BC in which the covenant with the Rechabites is made, right? Because that's when that's the year they're going to cross the Jordan River, right? And uh, so we had this 1335, and in in our history, what was the 1335 about? Because we did the 1335 from 508, you know, December. Because it brought us to 1843. Yeah, right. So it brought, brings us to the end of 1843, and it's December 25th, 508, right? That because that's going to be the baptism of Clovis, and and that's going to bring us to 1335 years is going to bring us to the end of 1843 as a symbol, 
and, and technically that's going to bring us to April April 18th at sunset in 1843. That's the end of Miller's predictions. So, so we have the symbol of the 1335. So it brings us to, so I'm, I'm going to draw this out and, and we'll see if it makes any sense. But yeah, that's a very good point, which is pertinent to what we're, we're doing here. Okay, so I'm on this microphone. It might have not sounded that good. That little discussion because I was on this microphone on the camera. <clears throat> okay. So this is the basic line, right? We, we all know about this. The Sunday law, the midnight cry, midnight, and this is 9-11, right? So this is... This is how we understood the lines in 2016. And this is the pattern that we received for the second angel's message from Millerite history. Right? So we, we know we have the first day of the first month. And we have the fifth day of the fourth month. And the first day of the fifth month. And the tenth day of the seventh month. So these become extremely important because... These numbers are going to tie us to Ezekiel, and they're also going to tie us to Ezra. So Ezra 7 to 10 is going to give us these two way marks, and this way mark is the center of a chiasm. But Ezra also gives us these other way marks. Um, and so I'm going to put them here as, well, I'll do it down here. 20th day of the ninth month. Uh, the first day of the 10th month and the first day of the first month. Okay, so these in 1844, we don't really mark those dates in any way. Right, we, we don't take, take this and, and extend these dates from the story of Ezra. Right. Right. But what we did do is we took the story of Ezra and we know that in 457 BC, we had this first day of the first month to the first day of the first month. And we lined that up with our history. So that is, we started at 9-11 and, and there was different ways that we did this. Um, but one of the things is we could see that we ultimately were pointed to the first day of the first month, because if I go here from the first day of the first month in 1844, and I go to the first day of the first month in 2030, that this period of time here is 2300 months, and that's actual lunar months, right? And that's going to be April 5th. 2030, right? And it's also 180, we'll do it this way. It's 186 years, just as it's 186 days, because this is the 187th day of the year, right? So this is 186 years, biblical years, to the day, because this is the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month in 2030. So you just do the math, you can see it's 186. But it's also uh, 180, I keep doing nines, 187 years and 20 months in prophetic time. So that is years of 360 days and months of 30 days. Now, of course, you could see I could do it as more years. I could take these months and, you know, get a different number here. But um, you can see this 18720 being this symbol. So, and, and part of that is we took this 
187 days because, or 187 years, because in the story of Abraham, we had chapter, was it chapter 12, 15, 17, and 22? Right? And we multiplied these together and we got, I think it was 9, 6, what was it? 9, 6, can somebody multiply those together? It's like 3, 2, 0 or something like that. If we multiply them together, what do we get? And since I can't see my screen, if somebody get, puts it in the chat, I won't notice it. So what number do we get? 17 times 22? Yes. Well, 12 times 15 times 17 times 22. I just can't remember the number. 63,320. Ah, that's what I did wrong. Okay. I knew there was something wrong. 63,000? No, 67. 67,000? Yeah. Oh. 320. Okay, that's better. So 67,320 is, is the result of multiplying these chapters that have the covenants in them. So this has to do with the covenant, right? And um, so when I saw this number, and we know that, that this was exactly 187 times 360, right? So, so we could figure that out. And I knew that this number looked very similar to the number that I had by multiplying 2,300 months by, you know, 2,300 by 29.530587, right? So I end up getting 600 days more, right? So this is also 67,920. Uh, you actually get like 919 in this large decimal, I think is what you get. So you round it up in today's, you have to round it up into the number of days. So it's going to be 920 days at the end, 67,920. So you can see it's 600 different. Um, so this was about a covenant. And so when we took this first day of the first month and in Millerite history, we went to the 10th day of the seventh month. And then we could connect that to the story of uh, and because halfway between here and here is the 10th day of the seventh month in the story of Ezra. Um, so we now had this structure that connected our history with Millerite history in this very specific way. But in order to get to the first day of the first month in April 5th, 2030, we actually had to take 9-11. So... So if you look at it this way, 9-11 is the first day of the first month in 1844, right? So we can connect it to April 5th, 2030. But 9-11 in our history is 2001. But we were connecting this by this span of time over here, which was um, taking 354 days, which is how many days it would take to get from the first day of the first month to the first day of the four, first month in 457 BC. And we were multiplying this by months, right? So 354 months, and we did it in two different ways, 30 day months and 29.53 day months. Right. So, so what I'm trying to say is that we have this 1844 is connected with our history, but our history, if it's the story of Ezra, doesn't end until the first day of the first month. Right. So we have this divorce over here. And what we're doing with the story of Samson is the story of Samson is going from 9-11 to where?
where, where are we taking the story of Samson? In our history, we're taking the whole story of Judges. We're taking it to 2023, right? So, so we're going to get to 2023. And 2023 is this history uh, connected here, right? And today, we're on this date that ends Collins' prediction in 2023, which marks the first day of the 10th month. And so we need to take this story of Samson that we're studying here right now in chapter 15, and we're going to examine also chapter 16. But what we saw is that in chapter 14, it gave us this history, right? From the 20th day of the ninth month, you can, you know, this is, uh, you know, December 25th, 2021, in a sense, right? Um, and, and we took this Odilio, so here, I'll do it this way. So, because this is a, it's a bit rather complex because we have the first day of the 10th month. Um, okay, so I'm going to do it this way. We're going to go Colin and Odilio. So this is this is in 2021, 2022. So this is 21, this is 22. And and they're going to bring us to today's date. Colin's prediction is going to bring us to today's date. And so we understand today's date as being in this story the period of the divorcement, right? I mean, this is all part of the same history. So right. the story of Samson is giving us details about this, but it's also tying us back to this. And not just 9-11, right, in, in the sense of our history, but even back to Millerite history. So, so there's a, a complexity here that I don't think we've we've been able to completely unravel. So it's sort of like when you have a name on the tip of your tongue and you can't remember it. That's kind of what I see here. It's just something that's beyond my, my vision. You know, to look at another metaphor. So we need to keep those things in mind, right? So as we look at these verses, um, and I'm going to do it this way here. So first, let's just look at, the, at this chart that we had, right? So, so we took uh, Odilio and Collins' prediction. Now, you know, I, I don't really mean to put Odilio's there on the first day of the 10th month because it's not. But um, maybe maybe we should do that some other way because we're taking this as Pentecost. So we're going to take this as the 20th day of the ninth month. We have this, this symbol there of the Sunday law, but that's obviously not the Sunday law on the big line. Right? So this is this is where our problem has has arisen, I think. We, we haven't really sorted out which line we're in because when we were taking those 777 days and we ended on the 20th day of the ninth month and we marked that the Sunday law and we had Rafi and Paniam being November 9th and July 18th uh, respectively were we wrong I don't believe so. No, we weren't wrong. We just didn't know what line we were in, right? And if we took that line and we zoomed it in onto like the bigger line, which we know there's a midnight that's still future, right? But we know 9-11 has passed. Um where what what way mark would we be zooming into? What way mark are we examining 
when we look at our history, like specifically the history of the 777. We must be zooming into some way mark. And wouldn't that way mark be midnight? Or is it a, um, a way mark in to a zoom into midnight, that there's a further zoom into midnight that creates a, 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 a line. And our line is just a zoom into one of those way marks. And do you understand what I'm saying? I would think that it's more the latter rather than the former. Okay. Yeah, so I'm thinking that that what happened to us in this experience, if we're going to make a parallel with Millerite history, um, we can see that we're we're still in Samuel Snow's letters, right? Agreed. And Samuel Snow's letters are really about the prediction before midnight which is going to be his last letter on July 18th, three days before midnight, right? Then he's going to be at midnight on the 21st of July, right? So on July 18th, he publishes his last letter, even though it was written earlier. And these are actually important details too, when we, we start looking at Samuel Snow's letters. But that three days becomes the symbol of the prediction before midnight. But his letters are part of a chiastic structure actually two different chiastic structures because we have the one just from the beginning to the end and the center of that is Pentecost. Now, wouldn't we say that if we were looking at Samuel Snow's history, um, that, that, that the Pentecost, or pardon me, it's not Pentecost, it's, it's gonna be the center of that one is going to be uh, Passover. And so when we were looking at Samuel Snow's letters originally, our movement was in Passover. It was this separation between Judas and the disciples, right? That was what was happening in that history. So when we go back to, you know, 2017, we're actually in the history that's going to result in what happens with Parminder, right? His group leaving, Judas betraying Christ. And then our movement moved to July 18th, right? But in July 18th, in our movement, is there a Pentecost? If we're following the pattern, there would have to be. Right. So you're going to move from Passover to Pentecost. And so if we're, if we're looking at somehow that Samuel Snow's letters are about this prediction before midnight, in order to get to the July 18th waymark, the, the actual one, which is going to be, you know, so that's what we don't understand yet. So that's where I'm trying to sort this through. But we know that we have to get to Pentecost first. So you're going to have the Passover where Judas betrays Christ. Christ is crucified. But you still need to get, and then he's going to be resurrected. And then you're going to get to Pentecost, and that's when the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out. Right? And, and this movement, at this present time, what we have been seeing is that we're moving towards the upper room, and that God's going to pour out his Spirit upon us. And right now we're in this discouragement of this disappointment still, from July 18th. Um, and, and so, so you know, we, we still have to sort through some things. But in doing that, so when we take the story of, of Samson here, so let's go back there. And we get this symbol of the midnight cry. We know that this is not the midnight cry because we are, we're, you know, on the big line, because we're not even there yet. We're, we're applying this to our history. And, and in our history, um, we've had many mid midnight cries. But we're going to have this symbol of Samson who represents Christ. 
but it has to be a message about Christ or a message connected with Christ about reflecting Christ's character. But it's done in this ironic way because do we reflect Christ's character? We would have to say no, right? We don't reflect Christ's character. We're unlike Christ. Now, in the story of Samson, Samson is... I liken this to the statement in Desire of Ages, where Jesus, Ellen White says that Jesus knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like his, a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. So, so we can only see our failures, right? We're, because we're looking at Christ. But even in what are our failures, so to speak, the mistakes that humanity makes. Christ turns those things around for good because we are on the path to following God. We are seeking to follow God. and But we're starting from this, this place of a disadvantage and Christ comes to us and offers his strength and man learns to trust in Christ. So, so that's why I believe the story of Samson is in this... I, sense and it specifically speaks speaks to us it also speaks to christ's human nature he had to come and conquer this nature that samson had now we address this idea of the covenant right so one of the things we can see is we can go to 158 bc and we can see the league with the romans the jewish league and we can count backwards 1335 days or years, I mean, to when they crossed the Jordan River, that history, 1493 BC. And so we can see that there's a connection. And then when we look at Millerite history, we can see the 1335 brings us to the first day of the first month. So does this, this story here, dealing with this jawbone of an ass, because this is all about what's going to happen in, in that story, is this all describing 9-11? And we can see that the church makes a covenant with the Protestants regarding spiritual formation. But there's also a covenant being made with his people at 9-11. Is there not? So we can take these negative examples, these counterfeits, so to speak, but we can look at them positively. Right. So when it comes to what the church is doing in their covenant with death, isn't there also a people making a covenant with God? So if we state it in this way, we have one that are, one group that is making a covenant with death. The other is making a covenant with life. Right. Yeah. They're choosing life They make and, and they're accepting the everlasting covenant. Because in this covenant, it's all based upon God's promises. What he will do in us, not all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient, which covenant they break, right? So, so here, um, we are called to, to have this covenant, this true, the everlasting covenant. And this movement, in coming to the upper room, must experience this everlasting covenant. We can't come to the upper room and not be converted. Right? We, we have to be converted. Now, we have all of these lines, all of these symbols, and we can see that we're going to have these symbols that bring us back uh, to 9-11. And the question is, well, why, if we just finished getting to 2023 in these in this story, why aren't we now being brought back to 9-11? And, and to me, the great slaughter brings us there as well as 15-8 in the sense of the midnight cry. But see, the midnight cry, we would think, is a way mark that, that happens after 9-11. But remember, when we look at the line that Ellen White had, she had the Sunday law followed by the loud cry, and she parallels the midnight cry to the loud cry. 
But in our history, we put the midnight cry before the Sunday law, not after the Sunday law. And Jeff didn't originally do this. He originally followed what Ellen White says. The loud cry parallels the midnight cry. And, and so people, when he started to move these way marks in their minds, um, and Jeff was just doing what God instructed him to do, even if he didn't fully understand the impl implications of it. But that's where this movement was led. And so many people left the movement when he started doing that, when he started uh, creating these way marks between 9-11 and the Sunday law. People joined the movement too, right? So there was other things happening. But a lot of people who originally were following Jeff could sort of accept uh, the parallels that he was making. But he was unsealing the seven thunders. And those seven thunders was the understanding of Millerite history. And so the, the understanding of Millerite history is, is the whole thing that this movement has been about as far as understanding what Millerite history is so that we can be prepared, that we can receive the light of the midnight cry because it shines all along the path so that we can stand at the Sunday law. So then um, we can see that 9-11 itself is a zoom into the Sunday law, that we put 9-11 before the Sunday law, but couldn't we also say that 9-11 is at the Sunday law, it just, just in a parallel? And that midnight and the midnight cry that follow 9-11 are actually prefiguring the events that follow the Sunday law? So not, not only are we repeating Millerite history, we're prefiguring uh, our own history. Does that make sense? It's a point to consider. Because Ellen White has the mighty angel of Revelation 18 come down at the Sunday law. Jones in 1893, he believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down in 1892 and that they're now in the loud cry. And he's not wrong, right? He just doesn't realize he's in a, a line that is prefiguring something that's going to happen in the future. And his line prefigures our line. So there's no way that we can say that where the, the midnight cry is before the Sunday law and not recognize that that means that in order to have a midnight cry, you have to have the Sunday law first. Now, in Millerite history, you know, we have the first day of the first month. And if you were to line up these way marks with with the bigger line the sunday law actually would precede the the midnight cry right i mean the loud cry the sunday law precedes the loud cry so wouldn't midnight um be the sunday law right if if you look at the line i'll just switch the screen here stop share and switch the screen so if you look at what's on the board here oops that's not going to help <laughs> so if we look at what's on the board here and we think about let's try to get more of it on here So think about Millerite, Millerite history from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. And Ella White says that the midnight cry follows the Sunday law, right? Or, or the loud cry follows the Sunday law. But we have the midnight cry before the Sunday law. So wouldn't that mean that the midnight cry here, if we're going to take it and put it into our history, if it parallels the loud cry, that the way mark before it would be the Sunday law, that midnight is the Sunday law. That is, if we're going to zoom into the Sunday law and say that our line is a zoom into the Sunday law from 9-11 to the Sunday law is a zoom into the Sunday law way mark on Ellen White's line, 
we can see all of this is the Sunday law. So 9-11 is the beginning of the Sunday law. But the Sunday law proper, if we're gonna, if we're gonna put it and, and line it up with Millerite history, that midnight would be the Sunday law, not 9-11, not the first day of the first month. It's gonna be the fifth day of the fourth month here. People understand what I'm saying or is there uh, trouble with what I'm saying? No trouble. No trouble? Okay. So this is something I was saying back a long time ago, a number of years ago. Um, seemed to me pretty, pretty clear that midnight must be the Sunday law if we're going to take our line. So that means that this midnight way mark, and we're, we're dealing with the prediction before midnight, right? So if we're going to look at this midnight way mark here, I'll just, I'll go here and draw a little bit more just to show you what I'm saying. Okay, so imagine this is our history here. This is midnight. This is still future. In order to look at Millerite history, they have this way mark here, first day of the first month that precedes midnight. But if we're gonna parallel our history, the only thing we have is Snow's letters, right? Correct. So that means we have this way mark here, July 18. Right? And that way mark July 18 is not one of the major main way marks in Millerite history. It's actually, this is gonna be the way mark, right? So we have this thing called the prediction before midnight. And the prediction before midnight goes from February 16th to July 18th, right? And the center of that is May 2nd, right? And this is, two months and 16 days. That is February 16th, which is second month, 16th day, becomes a symbol of this. Now this is also 153 cardinal days. It's actually, if you did it as ordinal, it's 77 and 77, right? So, so this is Samuel Snow's letters. And we know then, that we are still in this, what we call the prediction before midnight, right, these three days. And, and we know that this is, this is our history, that we're zoomed into this, and that the way mark that we're looking for is still, that's still ahead of us, is midnight. But midnight is also the Sunday law, right? That is, if we take Ellen White's big line, um, she's going to see, uh, you know, she's going to have the time of the end to 9-11 is going to be the first angel's message, right? That is, that's how we look at it. So this is also 1798. So 1798 is the first angel's message. And then the second angel's message arrives in, on April 19th, right? And that's why we have this lineup, April 19th, lining up with 9-11, first day of the first month, right? So this is the arrival of the second angel's message in Millerite history. So then if we take 9-11 and we line it up with Millerite history, Samuel Snow's letters are going to begin before 9-11 and end after 9-11. And remember the problem that we had is, well, this in, in Samuel Snow's letters is when 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel. 
But 9-11 also serves as a purpose that is um, the empowerment of the first angel. So that's going to be August 11th, 1840. So that symbol has to precede Samuel Snow's letters, right? So, so Samuel Snow's letters, in a sense, are a zoom into their own history. And he's prefiguring, he's prefiguring this date, October 22nd, because this is the 187th day of the year. And so that when he publishes his last letter before midnight, these letters here symbolize this prediction before midnight, but it's prefiguring something else. So if we're going to believe that we're repeating Millerite history, our pattern has to be the same. And the problem that people had is that they had an incomplete or an imperfect pattern of Millerite history. And as we continue to understand Millerite history, it allowed us to see our history more clearly. But many people couldn't bear seeing our history in what was being revealed by what we were passing through. So Samuel Snow's letters is still, if we, if we want to look at it in some ways, if we're repeating Millerite history, we're still here at July 18th, right? We haven't come to midnight yet, but we have this symbol of three days, and that three days is in the story of Ezra. The three days is in the story of Joseph, right? Three days is all through these histories. So this history here is, is really what this movement has been doing with July 18th, but we're still not past this. But in this history, we have been given a very specific piece of information. It's helped us understand the connection of Millerite history to the future. And if we look at Millerite history, see, it's going to go to the 10th day of the seventh month, the Day of Atonement. In the story of Ezra in 457 BC, do they have a Day of Atonement? Are they, are they operating, are they keeping the Day of Atonement, following what was given to in the Law of Moses regarding the Day of Atonement in 457 BC? Well, in the story of Nehemiah, it tells us that they're not. And why aren't they keeping the Day of Atonement here? What, they, they built the temple. The temple was built, you know, um, whatever it was. They don't years have an ark. What? They don't have an ark. Yeah, there's no ark here, right? So, so they don't have the Ark, they can't keep the Day of Atonement. So we know that even though this history prefigures Millerite history, that, that is, if you, take, if you take this as the story of Ezra, you know, the first, second, and third decrees, um, and so you're in 457 BC, and then you're going to have the 20th day of the ninth month, well, you see they're going to go through this process here that's prefiguring the history after October 22nd, 1844. But in their history, they can't have a Day of Atonement. But this is going to begin the 2300 days. And then the Day of Atonement is actually going to begin 2300 years later, right? So, so on October 22nd, 1844, Adventism is beginning a, a period the Day of Atonement that could have occurred here but didn't because there is no ark, but it's going to have the 70 weeks that transfers the promises from literal to spiritual Israel. Christ is going to begin his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary at the end of the 70 weeks, but he's also then, um, and, and specifically on Pentecost, right, which you're going to have a chiasm in this history when you put the 12th day of the first month in so, so then <coughs> the rest of this history is symbolizing 
all of the way from October 22nd, 1844 to the Sunday law, right? The first day of the first month, April 5th, 2030. This, of course, we take as the Sunday law, but this is a typical Sunday law. And the first day of the 10th month, all of these dates in the story of, of Ezra are completed in this year, right? And so we can take that year and we can put it from 9-11, but we can also use the 2300 months and the 186 years and the 187 years and 20 prophetic months to get us from, from this history to this history. So you can see this first day of the first month on April 5th, 2030, which is 2,640 days uh, from midnight tonight, that date will begin, or if you went from the biblical calendar from sunset tonight, it'll be 2,640 days from today, right? The end of today. I mean, this has to be extremely significant. This can't be something that is just a mathematical anomaly. And so we need to understand it. And we're not going to be predicting some event, right? Because we don't know whether it actually literally comes or not. But as a symbol, it exists. You know, and it's also the fifth day of the fourth month, just like this is. Right? April 5th. So I, I don't think that we can, right? And that's midnight, right? So the fifth day of the fourth month is midnight. And so if we were going to predict an event, I mean, I would predict that, that midnight's coming. Whether it comes on April 5th, 2030 or not is not the point. The point is the symbol is pointing to midnight. Is that making sense? So what the story of, of Samson does is it ties us, it ties all of this history together. Okay, you had a comment? I'm, I'm yet processing all of this. It's a lot to process. No kidding. Right. I mean, and, it, and it's difficult because in studying this, I mean, we have to sort of have these things in our minds. We can't, you know, this isn't something where we can just, you know, write some notes and forget about them. We, we have to keep all of these things in mind. Now, I'm, now we're saying that the 15th day of the eighth month or Judges 15, 8 is the symbol that's that's being focused here. Now, now, that symbol is the midnight cry. It's not midnight. But the midnight cry was given at midnight, right? Ellen White just puts it midway. It just wasn't empowered until August 15th. So, so there's still some things that we, we're not really sure about that April 5th, 2030 date. We know that it, it's a symbol of midnight being the fifth day of the fourth month which we haven't really addressed in any kind of detail. <clears throat> but we, we would have to look at what's happening here, what's happening in our study with this, these 300 foxes, which we put as the first day of the 10th month. So we're saying that that's where it is. So the story of Samson goes there. But it goes back and repeats this history, it, it brings us back to 9-11. It's trying to tell us something about our history, about our lines, because we know that Judges is from 9-11 to 2023. It connects us to this 2030 date, but it doesn't bring us through it. That is, 
it brings us up to this border, right? It's gonna bring us up to these dates that are an echo, right? An anniversary date, so to speak, if you wanna look at it that way, of these, these two lows that were offered a year ago, right? So if we look at, just look at the chart again that we had. <clears throat> What, what the story of Judges does is it brings us to here, but it doesn't bring us beyond here, other than with this line going to April 5th, 2030. Um, so Iran put 10th day of the, uh, the first day of the 10th month. So that's going to be, now you're writing it as uh, 101. So you're doing the 10th month, first day. And, and then you're taking the 264, right? So the 264 comes from 2,640 days. And you add them together, you get 365, right? Okay, so Iran says something like that. <laughs> okay, so, so we have these, the symbol of 365 has become important because we understand its relationship uh, as Stephen did. He tied the 300 to the 65 to get the 365 from the story of um, Enoch, right? 65 years old when he has Methuselah and then 300 years later, he's going to be translated. So you've got 365 years that he lived. And, um, through, and Iran has noted that that's a compliment, that a year is a whole thing. So if you have 365 complements that, that means it completes it, not uh, tells it that it is nice hair, right? So um, so we can see that this, this complement, these complementary numbers, these things that complete a whole, we saw that in 813 and 187, together they make up a thousand. So a thousand, which is a, you know, a basic unit, um, has within it this, if you take Palmoni, you also get 187, or if you take 187, you get Palmoni, right? So so these are important concepts. So we can see that all this history is, is attached. And so now when we look at the symbols that I asked for to, to look at dealing with 9-11, um, one of the symbols here is we have 3,000 and, and we also have 1,000, right? So there's gonna be 3,000 of the men of Judah they're going to take Samson, deliver him to the Philistines, and then he's going to kill a thousand Philistines, right? We also have the 20 years, which of course, the 20 years brings us from where to where. How, how did we address the 20 years? So that's going to bring, bring us from November 9th, 1980, where, no, it's going to bring us, pardon me, from 20 years, is going to bring us from 9-11, 2001. Into our history, right? So 2021. So we have that 20 years. So, so it says that he judges uh, the the Philistines judges Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. So we had we had addressed that. And 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 that also ties us to the end of Parminder's history. So our history, as we have seen in the story of Judges, is tied to 11:9, and it's also tied to 9:11. They become a symbol of each other. We zoom in a little bit, and 11:9 becomes 9:11 in a line. So you have a line where 11.9 is the beginning. 
And that line, of course, is our 777 structure. Okay, so we, so we have, of course, Islam, the jawbone of an ass, that slew a thousand. He slew a thousand men with that jawbone of the ass. Now, he also killed a bunch of other people um, in, in verse 8 and says there was a great slaughter. It doesn't tell us how many. Why doesn't it? I know I'm asking you to look into the mind of God. So why are we not told how many he kills that time when we have the great slaughter? Nobody with any thoughts on that? I hadn't considered this yet. Okay. I'm just doing some calculations here that I did earlier, just don't have them. Um, now with the 3000, right? So we had 3000, if we put that in today's and, and we just did it in like literal days and we wanted to know how long the span of time that was, it ends up being eight years and 78 days. And if we were going to put eight days and eight years and 78 days any place, where would we put it? If we're going to take that 3,000 as a span of time, because we've been able to take the numbers of a tribe and use them as a span of time. So if I took it as a span of time and I went from April 5th, 2030, and I went back, it would bring me to January 17th, 2022. Is January 17th, 2022 significant at all? Uh, nothing comes to mind. Okay, so nothing comes to mind. Now we know that um, um, you know we can have dates that are echoes or anniversaries of things, but um, anything we see about January seventeenth, twenty twenty-two, anything now as far as when we look at it on a calendar, um, when we look at it in the calendar converter, it's. Um, the 14th day of the 10th month on the biblical calendar. So we, so we don't have really anything <coughs> there, but 3000, if we put it there, we could, we could do that. Now, if we were to, um, Uh, okay, so John 11, verse 47 to 50. What do you see there, Angela? Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Um, I, it just came to me that as the Pharisees, you know, the Sanhedrin was convocating to, de to decide what they were going to do with Christ. And they were afraid that the, if they didn't stop him, then the Romans would come in and, and you know, really pummel them and destroy them. Just as I was comparing that to the men of Judah deciding to sacrifice turn and turn over Samson to, because they said that, you know, the, 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 the Philistines are ruling over us. And how dare you be slaughtering them and doing the things that you're doing? I just saw a parallel there. Okay. If you take 3,000 plus 183 year, years, a half a day, it goes to July 18, 2021. So this was another thing that Iran and I had done is uh, we took this as a symbol of 3,000 being um, like three years in a sense but we took it actually literal days to do the count. And then we took a half a year and that brought us to July 18, 2021. So we could take the 3000 and add half a year. So whether that was significant or not, I don't know, but that's what we did. Now, if we go back, as I said, if we go back from, uh, let's look at it this way here, I'll share the screen here, what I'm doing. Um, I just uh, had a comment. Yep. Um, just an observation. We had noticed there that one place was playing by something that was rather under the mass. Yeah, you're breaking up a little um, bit. Can you repeat that? Okay, so we noticed that uh, 1,000 was playing with a job in of an ass by uh, Thompson. Yeah. And, uh, I'm just thinking that the God of the, the God, that's my idea, that's obscure, but the God of the Philistines was Dagon, and he was a fish god. Yeah. So I'm just, uh, with, with fish, it's, that's connected with the uh, geometric, uh, geometry figure of the Fisca uh, Fiscus. You only have two circles. Yeah. And they sort of uh, overlap. And you get the fish shape. Yes. Now, if, if, if you have the circle being, I think it's a diameter or whatever, the circumference being 1,000, the, uh, the space in between that overlaps will be 391. Oh, okay. So, okay. So you have. Yeah. Yeah, so you have the thousand, the thousand there, and then you throw the fish, and then uh, connecting with the Philistines, and then you have 391 connecting with the ass, the jawbone, which is connecting 391 to Islam, the symbol of the, the, the jawbone. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I kind of see that there. I, I just have a question here with, um, with this geometry, though. So if I take a circle, it, it's divided. Um, like we could take it as, you know, a measurement of inches or feet or things like that. doesn't matter what the unit is. But if we take it as 360 and, and you overlap uh, it with another circle, um, basically you're breaking the line of that circle at a certain number of degrees, right? So you're cutting out a section of degrees. Um, so I ne I've never thought about this before, but if I was to, I mean, you could overlap them at different points, right? I mean, you overlap them at one point, they don't really make much that looks like a fish. There's just two circles next to each other. As you bring them farther apart, let's say you have two circles on top of each other, and then you just start separating. I mean, I don't know at what point they are a fish, but there must be some way in which we can understand the relationship between uh, how many degrees are being taken up um, by that curve of the fish and how many, and, and the area that's there or something. It's just something, the, uh, yeah. I think it was uh, one, of the, one of the Pythagoras or something. He done a calculation that he found it, it came to very close to the square root okay. of three. There's a way of calculating square roots with these here. 
I think it's right in the center. It's the one over one of the circles must overlap right and come to the right to the middle of the other circle is how this yeah. year uh, the geometry thing is yeah, done. If you, could, if you could draw a diagram that represents this and explains it better so that we can mm -hmm. see it, that would be really good if you could do that. Okay. And then uh, I think there was the number 153 as well connected with it. I think it's the number 265. Or divided by 153 was the square root of three. So that's, I think that was the. Okay, that's really one of the calculations connecting to it. Okay. So you have that fish, that fish connection there with that 153. Okay, so that's really interesting. So um, yeah, do that for us. Now, of course, our time is, is almost up. Now, um, so the one thing that I want you to notice here. So if I go 3,000 days prior to April 5th, 2030, I get the first day of the 17th or the 17th day of the first month, correct? Now, if I go 1,000 days before I get April 23rd, right? So I clicked on it. But April 23rd is the 17th day of the first month on the biblical calendar. So isn't what's happening here sort of a a fractal, right? I, you know, from 3,000 then to, uh, and then 1,000, which is one third of that. And I still get the same result. So what I'm trying to say here is that in this story of Samson at the end is sort of a repeat and enlarge of, of this, this whole story, that this story here dealing with this jawbone of the ass brings us back to 9-11. But it shows us that, that the earlier history here in Samson is, is really a repeat of this history in some way. And then, of course, he's going to be thirsty and he's going to drink from this jawbone, right? So, And God's going to cleave, one, two, three, four, baka. Ran, break, rip open. Uh, so he's going to use numbers to do this, right? Because one, two, three, four represents numbers, doesn't it? Yes. But it's also a, uh, if we think about cleaving something uh, in half, right? I mean, it, it can represent a chiasm as well. Right, and then it's going to make a hollow place. That's uh, like an analogy, a socket of a tooth, right? That was in the jaw, right? And and then you're going to then this, then there came water, so we know what water represents, right? Uh, there out, and when he had drunk, his spirit came again, so he's revived, so we can see that revival there. And then he calls the place uh, Ane Hakore, the fountain of one calling, uh, which is in Lehi, right? And, and it's going to be called that Lehi. So it's, and, and, and this is, Echinor is going to be called that until this day. Um, and then he's going to judge Israel, the days of the Philistines, 20 years. So we're going to take that from... <clears throat> Uh, 9 11 to 2001 as a symbol. Now, in this um, 20 years, uh, where did you place this, Stephen, as far as in the context of uh, uh, the 40 years oppression? Yeah, so roughly midway, maybe just before midway. Beginning okay. them 40 years, so maybe around the 19th year and around that time, maybe just before the 20th year of the creation. So, so he's going to start, you're saying, halfway through or end halfway through? Well, he's going to start, well, yeah, these 20 years are going to begin with this teenager. This right. Degree. Yeah, so, so he's going to be born near the beginning of the 20 years, or the 40 years, I mean, 
right? Maybe maybe eight, 18 years and seven months, actually. 18 years and seven months you have? <laughs> Just kind of like a guess. Yeah. So you're yeah, roughly around that age. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so there is some interesting things about, about this story and how it connects to uh, this 40 years. Now, if we take the 40 years um, and we go from 1989 to 2030, I mean, that's going to be 40 years, right? So, so we know that Samson arrives from 1989 to uh, 9-11 is going to be, you know, it's a bit more than 20 years, but we'll just call it, uh, if you take that 7-7 and you bring it to the end, and I've done different calculations on how to do this, but we can see that the uh, Samson is promised at the beginning of these 40 years, but obviously he doesn't become a judge until later, right? Okay, so we're still going to have to come back to this uh, tomorrow again. Um, but I think we're a little bit closer to understanding how to address these on a line. And, and then when we get to ch chapter 16, which I don't think we'll get to tomorrow, uh, we won't get there. Um, this is going to be a repeat and enlarge. At least that's how I've seen it. But sometimes there's just things that we don't, we didn't notice the first time we went around this. Okay. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, so we should be praying for the movement. I mean, I mean, this day is marked. It's not like we're expecting some event or anything. Though I am getting my new whiteboard today. It's, it's going to be arriving. Um, that, that's kind of a symbol, just like... Uh, um, Miller receiving his concordance. At least that's the way I take it. So, um, so we should be praying for one another, praying for this movement. We still have a lot of work ahead of us and um, a lot of work in our own lives and a lot of work that God has given us to do. So, so we need to pray about that every day. Okay, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the study this morning, um, for the things that you are teaching us, even though we don't fully understand them all. Uh, we know, Lord, that this is light and it is guiding us. Um, we pray for this movement. I pray, Lord, that even though Colin didn't predict this date explicitly, it's implied in his structure and that this marks... Um, You know, we're marking here the beginning of this uh, separation from uh, the foreign wives. And uh, Lord, we need uh, your help in this regard in our personal lives. Help us to trust in you. I take the light that you have given us. And um, we pray for each person that you can work in their lives. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.